Do you suffer from headaches, swollen breasts, constipation, insomnia, irritability, blood clots, cyclical disorders, concentration problems and reduced desire? Then we should think of estrogen dominance, because these are typical complaints. And maybe you'll recognize yourself right away and think, I've got that. Then you should be careful now. Yes, let's start basic, estrogen dominance. What is that actually? I think you've heard of the hormone estrogen before. The female hormone, even if I produce estrogen just like that. But it is known as the female hormone. And progesterone is also available. And the two, they are a bit yin and yang, complement each other, but also have totally opposite functions. I'll show you a table here again, where all these functions of estrogen and progesterone are listed. And you can understand that if you look at it like that, that if a hormone is too high or too low, that there can be quite a few problems in the entire human system. Now it is the case that a hormone can either be absolutely too much or too low, i.e. really measurable, or the relationship of the individual can be too high or too low. Let me explain it a little differently. I take your blood or look in the saliva for your hormones and then the writing comes back or my call and I say, Mrs. Muller, the hormones are all in the norm range, in the reference range. But that doesn't mean that you can't have problems either. And that's the big problem if you only rely on these reference areas. Because it's still not a well-being area. There is a relationship to each other that can still be shifted. So even if estrogen and progesterone are in the reference, in the measurable reference window of the laboratory, it can still be that there is a difference and you still have problems, complaints of estrogen dominance. We'll talk about this relationship in a moment, how it should be best. How does estrogen dominate? Now it's getting really important. I ask for your attention. So we can imagine that if we produce too much of the estrogen, then it can lead to estrogen rising further and progesterone remaining relatively constant. But it can also be that estrogen is completely normal and is also produced normally, but that progesterone slides off. And then we also have this estrogen dominance. And that's why the production is very important to get out. And sometimes that's not that easy. And that's what you're in for, because we need your life story to find out if that could be the case. I'm going to sketch a few examples now that are classic, but there are still far more causes for estrogen dominance. Let's start with a classic. A classic that concerns you shortly before the changing years. That's always a very fuzzy term, because changing years go on for decades. I mean the so-called pre-menopause. So let's talk about 40 upwards. Yes, it starts very early. What happens there? I'll show you my favorite graph of hormones here. That you will have more and more cycles in the year where no ovulation takes place. No ovulation takes place, then no progesterone is produced. If no progesterone is produced, then it will slowly but surely go into the basement over the years. But what remains relatively constant is estrogen. And that's exactly the problem that many women have in the pre-menopause. And just the complaints that we mentioned earlier, from headaches, chest pain, weight gain, constipation, insomnia, bleeding, and I can go on. These are exactly the problems that often occur in the pre-menopause. And it is precisely these women who must be helped. And it is clear that if you follow this for a long time, this estrogen dominance automatically arises. Nothing else happens, by the way, in a physiological cycle. I have explained this a thousand times here on this channel. If we concentrate completely at the end on the two hormones estrogen and progesterone in the cycle, exactly that happens. Because estrogen will stay relatively high and then the progesterone comes from above, because it did not come to a pregnancy, and cuts the line from estrogen. And if you look at it statically, we have estrogen dominance a few days before the period. And what do these women often have? Yes, a premenstrual syndrome. So there is a premenopausal and a premenstrual syndrome, which, however, has the same background. Only in the case of premenstrual syndrome, with the onset of the period, it is gone. Next topic, overweight, adiposity. Nobody likes to hear it, I know, but it has a very physiological, biochemical background. In fat cells, especially in belly fat, there is an enzyme called aromatase. Sounds like a nice name, is also a nice name for an enzyme. And this aromatase makes from the hormone testosterone, yes, which you women also have, not just us men, estrogen is formed from the testosterone. And of course that is done more often when we have more fat cells. 
And this enzyme aromatase is also very, very important, because you can also imagine who has a lot of this enzyme, fat cells, who also has a lot of estrogen under the line. Because the testosterone is absorbed and estrogen comes out at the back. And it occurs in both adiposity, in overweight, but also in PCOS, i.e. In polycystic ovarian syndrome, long-term estrogen dominance with all the side effects that it can bring with it. Oh, we come to the next pillar that nobody likes to hear, stress. Yes, we all have stress. And I always ask the patients, are you stressed right now? I don't mean the normal stress that we all have, but extraordinary stress. What happens with stress? I've already explained it several times here. Let's focus on the progesterone if we want to take a look at the synthesis of the individual hormones in the picture. Progesterone is bypassed or even cut off if we have excessive stress. Because you can build a lot of great things from the progesterone, including cortisol, the stress hormone. So if we want to produce a lot of stress hormones because we have a lot of stress, then unfortunately this is at the expense of progesterone. What happens? The progesterone level slowly drops into the basement. Cortisol rises, which is not so good either. But estrogen remains relatively untouched from the whole story, because that is a dead end in the synthesis of hormones. So again, stress-related estrogen dominance occurs. And here, too, we have the classic problems again and you think it is due to stress. Yes, it is, but it is actually due to estrogen dominance, which, in turn, is due to stress. Oh, if we're already talking about lifestyle, then let's also talk about nutrition. Yes, so that I can now really fill the three hate topics with many. But unfortunately everything is explainable. In terms of nutrition, we have the habit of eating junk food. And junk food often contains a byproduct that doesn't really make it any better. And that's histamine. Maybe you've heard of it before. A histamine intolerance. So people who swell up after a tomato and so on. Histamine is an inflammatory byproduct, if you will. And if you have a lot of histamine, then you don't just get chronic inflammatory changes in the body and also stomach problems. Endometriosis is a huge topic. But histamine also does the following on the ovary. A so-called H1, histamine 1 receptor, is used to influence the aromatase on the ovary. In other words, it's screwed up. So histamine promotes aromatase. Testosterone comes in and is converted to estrogen. Here we have this aromatase in play again. So here again the problem is that I eat junk food. I eat a lot of histamine. And at some point I have the problem that a lot of estrogen is formed because of it, without me noticing anything of it. And if we're already at the aromatase concentration, which can also increase or increase in a certain way, alcohol. So if you swirl in a bottle of wine every day, you've not only done something for your histamine level, but also screwed up the aromatase at the same time. And here, too, the same principle. Estrogen goes up sooner or later. If we're already at nutrition, then I would also like to address the xenostrogens. I'll explain it to you. It all sounds more complex than it is. The xenostrogens are almost foreign hormones, hormone-like substances, which are also referred to as hormone disruptors. In pesticides, in cosmetics, in any creams, shampoos, UV filters from sunscreens, so-called xenostrogens can be in them. BPA in bottles, very bad. In the long run, this causes a hormone disruption in favor of this estrogen. So again an estrogen dominance, which is why we should be careful what we take with us, what kind we take with us. I've made a very detailed Instagram post about it. There I have listed the whole thing and explained it to you again in detail and in peace. So so that the topic doesn't overlap here now, I would like to point you to the Instagram post in my profile. So I just want to address one thing. This is the so-called yellow body hormone weakness, which is why this quotation mark is often misdiagnosed. Because why doesn't the yellow body develop as it should? Because most of the time something is not okay in the first phase of the cycle. That means this follicle ripening. From the follicles the yellow body is created at some point. It's not 100% good. That's why the second phase of the cycle and the yellow body hormone can't work well either. So you concentrate heavily on this second phase of the cycle, but the problem may lie in the first one. It has nothing to do with the whole phase here. But what I would like to explain is, of course, if you have a cycle disorder, a hormone disorder, it comes to no or no sufficient ovulation, it comes to no or no sufficient yellow body. And progesterone is not in the spheres where it should actually be. If it happens once or twice a year, it's not a problem. It can compensate for the body. But if it happens seven, eight, nine, ten times, like, for example, in women who also have the PCO again, then it can happen that progesterone slips away in the long term. And we have a completely normal measurable estrogen again, maybe even a measurable progesterone, which is in the reference range. Peaks for the beginning of the cycle, for example, 
and you think, oh, no, the hormones are all right. But the hormones are just not okay. I'm showing you here as a list, because otherwise I'm mumbling to myself here again. The complaints that are very classic. That's just a digression. The list could be twice as long if you want to take it exactly. But these are the classics with which women come into my practice with an estrogen dominance. And if you find yourself here somewhere again, then you should definitely clarify that. And how does this clarification actually work? I'll be right back. The diagnosis, how do you actually get it out now that you have it? If you look into the textbooks here, then you can see very quickly that estrogen dominance is actually not in existence in the curriculum of specialists in gynecology. This is a big problem, because as you have heard, this problem is quickly achieved that you have an estrogen dominance. That's why I'm trying to explain it again briefly here, how to get a diagnosis. The first step is to listen. No, the first step is actually that you listen to your body and write down what problems you have. When you have these problems, what also plays a role in terms of nutrition, histamine, etc. Are you okay if you had a cheese plate and a glass of red wine the next day? Really bad. Are you bloated, etc. Speak for a histamine intolerance. If you want to have a video about histamine intolerance, then you are welcome to write a comment below. I'm happy to do something about it. Also your view of endometriosis is a very important topic. If you come to us with all these complaints and I listen to all of them, for example, then of course you get a certain feeling for it. A gynecological examination is part of it, because I just want to exclude other diseases, such as PCO syndrome. Maybe that's the explanation. So I have to do a good examination, do a good ultrasound, also look at my mucous membranes. And if, for example, the mucous membranes come up with such a blatant bulge, I also know that hormone estrogen seems to be very, very dominant here. Otherwise the mucous membranes would not have developed so blatantly. The cycle anamnesis is part of it, etc. So the whole story about being a woman first belongs on the table. And that's why it's still a topic that's difficult to become a man or a woman, because we have six, something minutes of time per patient, which is a huge health political problem. Because these women need help. And if we don't have time, because we don't get a fee for it, for example, then of course it's not fun. That's why the preparation, that's why I make such videos, is totally good. If you're already coming, I think I have an estrogen dominance. Super good, you can work with that. Let's get to hormone determination. That's something you always want to say, I just want to have my hormones determined. I want to see if everything is okay so far. Difficult topic, especially in the female cycle, where cycle day 3 to 5 completely different hormone values come out, like cycle day 14, like cycle day 28. So it's basically super important that you know, where do I stand in the cycle, do I even have a cycle? And then also know how to interpret that. That's why a hormone determination, usually cycle day 3 to 5, is not a bad idea as a base hormone lab. But it may also be that you get this laboratory evaluation and everything is great, everything is great. It's not a single value outside of the norm, neither too low nor too high. And you go home and sit there, have your complaints. But hormonally everything is fine. I have already mentioned that the relationship to each other is important. And unfortunately there is little to no good information here. But there are guidelines and you should write them down. Or we gynecologists also write them down. Because you can work well with that. And here it is important that the base hormone lab, yes, cycle day 3 to 5, but if I want to know the relationship from estrogen to progesterone, the second cycle phase is the better one. Because when I measure at the beginning, I always have progesterone in the basement and estrogen mostly in the basement. So we really want to go into the second cycle phase and look at the relationship there. And then there used to be 1 to 100, 1 to 200 ratio of estrogen to progesterone. These are now quite shifted. Because that is no longer a comfort zone. The comfort zone for women in the second cycle phase is usually 1 to 60 to 1 to 80, roundabout. But every comfort zone is also very individual. Nevertheless, there is already a rough guideline so that you know that the ratio even fits. For women after the transition years, it is a bit lower. It's about 1 to 30 to 1 to 50. That's usually an area where women feel reasonably comfortable. So it's really about taking the hormones and putting them in relation to each other. There is even an estrogen to testosterone ratio. That's about 1 to 6 to 1 to 10. That's a ratio where women feel relatively comfortable. Of course, this also applies to men. So these comfort zones are important to know. And that's just an epidemiological data collection from many, many years that you've seen. Here are areas where women and men feel okay accordingly. Yes, what can I do about it? I know, the question is burning on your nails now. And it's not always that easy. 
Because you always have the feeling that you go to your gynecologist, your gynecologist explains your problem. And then you leave the practice and have the solution to the problem in your hand. Unfortunately, this is the case with holistic medicine. And that's the medicine for women. It is holistic and sometimes very sluggish. Because such a cycle also reacts sluggishly, in the long run. So you have a lot in your own hands. And we mentioned nutrition, lifestyle earlier. Alcohol consumption, diet, histamine. Nutrition advice is definitely part of it. To see what I actually eat all day. And is that good or bad? And also to see, do I do enough exercise, enough sport? Do I have a lot of aromatase on me? Nice description, I have a little belly fat for that. Or does it all fit with me? So that's really the first thing you should ask yourself. What can I do better as a woman? So that my aromatase drops and my estrogen level may slowly return to normal levels. And that's why a nutritious diet that doesn't cause inflammation is incredibly important. Not just with endometriosis, which, by the way, also often goes hand in hand with estrogen dominance. But also with classic estrogen dominance. And also in the changing years. A diet that doesn't cause inflammation is simply very, very important. And a good diet advice is also part of it. And about this diet that doesn't cause inflammation, that's often included right away. That's the nice thing, it's also very important to eat a balanced diet. Because we just have to keep our intestines healthy. You've already heard, this whole system, women, it's not just limited to the ovaries or to any one place, but it really starts with the intestinal health, which has to be good. And the rest, if the intestinal health is correct, is already relatively well under control. And there are a few nutritional things that you should definitely keep in mind. I'll list them for you. These are cross flowers. This is a good supply of special vitamins and pro-hormones. Drink a lot, reduce stress. I know everything to my heart's content. Yes, but if you want to change something, you have to go through it. And that's almost a promise from every nutritional medical advice that after three to six months there will be a significant improvement if you tackle it here and change your lifestyle accordingly. It's almost a promise, and it almost never happens with doctors. But that can only help and can only make it better. Now there are a few more things that you can do in addition. And these are so-called phytohormones. I also talk about this in my year-round course, that you can spice up this estrogen dominance a bit. And somehow the estrogen has to get to the receptor. If a lot of estrogen is on the way, then all receptors are blocked and there are these complaints that we have already said 10 times. If I block these receptors beforehand with something that also has a kind of estrogen structure, but does not have the same effect, then the free-flowing estrogen does not come into effect. And then it just keeps floating around. This is where the phytohormones or these phytoestrogens come into play, i.e. plant-like, hormone-like substances. These are very important to simply slow down this estrogen dominance. Soya, huge buzzword, isoflavone. I have already made my own episode about this. You are welcome to take a look at how the whole thing works and which nutrients are really suitable for you. Yes, a huge topic, isn't it? You could have talked about it for another two hours, but I think I was able to sketch it a bit roughly. If you say now, histamine intolerance, that really triggers me, I would like to know what exactly plays a role there or what exactly is the matter with nutrients that inhibit inflammation. Then please write it to me in the comments. Only when I see that there is a need, can I make videos. Otherwise, you are welcome to watch this video again. It's about endometriosis, an important topic, especially when we talk about it here. And of course, you can do a lot with the cycle in terms of nutrition. The video is also worth gold. But what is even more valuable than gold is a subscription. And you can leave that to me now. Then I can help you so that I can help you better. See you in the next video.